Ever get the feeling we don't know the whole story when it comes to Shakespeare? Like, what if there are plays out there linked to him, but we're not quite sure if he actually wrote them? That's what we're diving into today. Shakespearean Apocrypha. Okay, so not fake Shakespeare. Right. right. Apocrypha means plays connected to Shakespeare, but with some big question marks about authorship. Gotcha. So are we talking about, like, dusty old manuscripts hidden away in a vault somewhere? You'd think so, right? But actually, no. We're talking about plays performed during Shakespeare's lifetime. On the London stage, audiences buzzing about them, and get this, some were even printed with his name on them. Wow. So if they had his name on them back then, why are we still questioning them now, centuries later? That's the million-dollar question, isn't it? What seemed like solid evidence back then might not hold up under the scrutiny of modern scholarship. Makes you wonder how much we don't know about the past. It really does. So to try and unravel this, we're looking at three plays today. The London Prodigal, The Yorkshire Tragedy, and Pericles, Prince of Tyre. And we'll see if we can separate fact from fiction, or at least try to. Ambiguity is part of the fun when dealing with these older texts. Right? It keeps us on our toes. Let's start with The London Prodigal, published in 1605, right in the middle of Shakespeare's career. Mm -hmm. And here's the kicker. It had his name on it. Case closed, right? Well, not so fast. Here's where things take a turn. The London Prodigal, despite that 1605 publication with Shakespeare's name, was left out of the first folio. Hmm. Okay. Now, for those of us who aren't Shakespeare scholars, what's the first folio and why does that matter? Great question. The first folio, published in 1623, was basically the first attempt to gather all of Shakespeare's plays into one big collection. Ah, okay. Kind of like the definitive Shakespeare collection. Exactly. Put together by his colleagues after his death to preserve his work. So you can imagine when a play published with his name during his lifetime is missing from that collection, scholars raise an eyebrow. Right, it's a big deal. Like finding a signed first edition of a famous author's book, then realizing it's missing from their complete works later on. Something's not adding up. Exactly. And that's where the debate begins. Now, we found this YouTube video arguing for the London Prodigal being a true Shakespeare way. And they base this on a character named Matthew, described as the London Prodigal. They think it might be a subtle nod to Shakespeare's own life. It's certainly possible. Playwrights often draw inspiration from their own experiences, even if it's hidden within the story. And the video points out a really interesting detail about the language. Apparently, using the definite article, the before London prodigal, was unusual back then. They're suggesting it wasn't just any prodigal, but the prodigal, like a specific person everyone knew, maybe even a real-life prodigal Shakespeare might have encountered. Oh, that's interesting. Makes you wonder who that real-life London prodigal might have been. But hold on. The London prodigal was included in the third folio, which came out in 1664. So which is it, Shakespeare or not? That's the thing about these apocryphal plays. There's always another twist. The third folio's inclusion definitely muddies the waters. So even with Shakespeare's name on those early editions, the London prodigal is still up for debate. Absolutely. And that's a perfect example of how authorship isn't always black and white, even with plays from Shakespeare's time. It's like trying to solve a puzzle where the pieces keep changing shape. That's a great way to put it. Okay, so let's move on to... The Yorkshire Tragedy. Now, this one was published in 1608, again, during Shakespeare's lifetime, but this time with his initials W.S. on the title page. Very interesting. So not his full name, but still a pretty direct link. Right. And get this. It was officially registered with his name, too. You can't get much more concrete than that, can you? You'd think not, right? But just like our friend the London Prodigal, the Yorkshire Tragedy was M.I.A. from the first folio, then pops up again in the third folio. It really makes you wonder what those compilers were thinking. It's enough to make your head spin. Now, there's a YouTube video out there that suggests this play might be based on a real-life murder that happened around the same time. It's a pretty gruesome story. But they draw some interesting parallels between the play's plot and the actual events of the crime. Yeah, and it really highlights how playwrights in Shakespeare's time often drew inspiration from current events. It's like Shakespeare and his contemporaries were the original true crime podcasters, in a way. Huh? Uh-huh, right turning those ripped-from-the-headline stories into dramatic works for the stage. And speaking of potential authorship, this is where things get even more interesting. A scholar named Henry Dugdale Sykes attributed the Yorkshire tragedy to someone else entirely, George Wilkins. Okay, hold on. So not Shakespeare. Someone else wrote it. 
That's what Sykes argued. He was a contemporary of Shakespeare's, this George Wilkins. And to make it even more intriguing, Sykes connects Wilkins to a prose pamphlet about the same murder case. So are we talking about two different works inspired by the same real-life event? It's pretty wild. It really is. Did the murder inspire the play? Did it inspire the pamphlet? And potentially by different people. It's like this tangled web of inspiration. And hold on. The YouTube video we mentioned throws another name into the mix. Remember Christopher Marlowe? Oh, how could we forget Marlowe, a giant of Elizabethan theater full of mystery himself? Right. And this video suggests that the Yorkshire tragedy might actually be an allegory for Marlowe's life and death. Wow. That's quite a theory. Right. It's a pretty bold claim. So what do you think? Is there any weight to that? It's certainly intriguing, right? Marlowe's life was pretty dramatic, and his death, shrouded in mystery, you could say. Maybe this play was a way for someone to comment on his life and work, but using a different story to do it. It's like a hidden code within the play itself. And that actually leads us perfectly into our next play, Pericles, Prince of Tyre. Now, Pericles was initially left out of the first folio, right? Just like Prodigal and Yorkshire Tragedy. But here's the difference. Pericles is now generally considered to be, at least partially, written by Shakespeare. Right. That's the interesting part about Pericles. It's made its way into most modern Shakespeare collections. So what changed? Why is this one different? Well, it goes back to how literary scholarship works. Back in the day, they relied a lot on, well, who published what and when. But now, we've got more tools in our belts, you know. So it's more than just looking at who published the play and when. Exactly. Now we can analyze the writing style, compare the language, even get into things like the rhythm and rhyme schemes. And when you look at Pericles this way, there are parts, particularly towards the end, where Shakespeare's influence really shines through. His language, his imagery, the way he structures the scenes, it's all there. Like finding his fingerprints all over the play, even if his name's not on the cover. That's a great way to put it. But then if it's so clear in Pericles, why wasn't it in the first folio to begin with? Good question, right? Back to square one again. <laughs> well, remember, we're talking about a time when playwrights collaborating wasn't uncommon at all. It's entirely possible Shakespeare worked on Pericles with someone else. Maybe he even had a smaller hand in it. Huh. So maybe that's why some parts feel different, like maybe someone else wrote those bits. Exactly. And unfortunately, we just don't have those records, those little notes passed back and forth to say for sure how it all came together. It really makes you think about those collaborations, though, right? Mm -hmm. Was there a clear plan or did they just bounce ideas off each other, you know? Did Shakespeare have a writing buddy? I wish we knew. Sadly, a lot of those details are lost to time. But that's what's so fascinating about these explorations, right? We get these glimpses into the world of Elizabethan theater, wow. the creative energy, the collaborations, and, yeah, the mysteries of who wrote what. It's like we're putting together this puzzle, but we're missing some pieces. Mm. We might never have the full picture, but the search itself is exciting. Exactly. And it just goes to show... Our understanding of history, even literary history, is always evolving. New discoveries, new methods. Who knows what we'll uncover next? It's a journey, that's for sure. But okay, so we have these three plays, all with their own twists and turns, all raising questions about authorship. What does all of this tell us about, well, about literary scholarship itself? Yeah. Especially when dealing with someone as significant as Shakespeare. It's like we're looking back through time, but the glass is all blurry. Right. And that's especially true with someone like Shakespeare. We put him on this pedestal, but he was just a guy writing plays, you know, part of a whole system, a world we can barely imagine now. It's humbling in a way to think even with someone as famous as Shakespeare, there's still so much we don't know. Makes you wonder what else we've gotten wrong, just assuming things. Oh, absolutely. And that's what makes these disputed plays so interesting. They show us how much of scholarship, of history, is about interpretation. It's not just about finding the facts, but figuring out what they mean. So it's not just about these three plays. It's about how we understand authorship. Right. Like, what does it even mean to be the author of a play, especially back then? Exactly. These plays force us to think about that. Back then, collaboration was common. People were writing together, maybe even changing each other's work. Who gets the credit then? It's messy. Not so clear cut, huh? Not at all. And that's what makes it so fascinating. It challenges us to rethink things, to embrace the ambiguity, the multiple perspectives. History isn't a straight line. It's more like a tangled up ball of yarn. Trying to find the end of the thread. Exactly. And that's what's so great about studying these apocryphal plays. They make us ask tough questions, challenge what we think we know, and appreciate just how complex literary scholarship can be. We may never know for sure about every play, but 
the journey is what's important, right? Absolutely. It's the search for answers that makes it so interesting. Well said. It's like those puzzles, even if you don't finish it, you learn something along the way. Well, a huge thank you to our expert for taking us on this deep dive into Shakespearean mystery. My pleasure. Always happy to talk Shakespeare. And for all you listeners, we hope you've enjoyed the ride. Remember, the world of literature is full of twists and turns, so keep exploring, keep asking questions, and never be afraid to get lost in a good mystery. Until next time, happy reading.